But you can't really think about improving the well-being of people in these countries in a sustainable manner if you do not tackle simultaneously issues related to population growth as well as um, um, uh, issues related to the environment and, uh, and improving their capacity to adapt. just going to give an overview uh, given the presentations that have happened today on the theme of the conference um, uh, that is looking really at um, uh, population dynamics, environment and uh, uh, well-being. Uh, the, the, the topic of course is boom or bust. Um, so I'll look at demographic trends. I'll do that very quickly because I think a lot of this has been pounded on and on uh, during the day today. I'll talk about the case for uh, harnessing the demographic dividend in Africa and uh, what the evidence is showing and uh, what that seems to indicate in terms of uh, what policy actions should be, and then see how to integrate uh, uh, climate change, environment, and, uh, and uh, population uh, issues. So uh, to get started, uh, oh, I can move this down here because I don't need to see myself. <laughs> All right, uh, really just, just to, to, to emphasize the point that uh, Sustainable development priorities revolve around the well-being of people and the environment. And uh, if you look at the uh, first uh, environment conference in 92, where the concept of sustainable development was kind of uh, defined there, we really are looking at not just thinking about the well-being of people, but making sure that there's that co uh, 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 there's, there's that you know coexistence and the equilibrium between. Um, uh, between people, uh, the well-being of people and the well-being of the uh, of the environment. Um, so, I think the, the, a good starting point in talking about this is really to acknowledge that the rest of this century, the 21st century, is a century that is going to witness um, a very phenomenal uh, demographic changes. There's there's a revolution of sorts really when you look at how change was happening in the past and how it's it's going now. Every country is going through demographic changes uh, of different sorts, di uh, different regions and so on. And, and in all that, we are looking at issues to do with population growth. And throughout the discussions today, we've heard also about you know, consequences of um, a, a, a decline in population numbers. There's the whole issue about the spatial distribution of population, which is uh, mainly you know, driven around urbanization. Uh, we know that in all regions, urbanization is going up, more so in Africa, South Asia, and so on, the regions that we are, are, are behind. But when we talk about uh, the movement of people, there is also the, uh, we have to recognize that internal migration is likely to become more prominent uh, due to forced displacements, some of them due to climate change, but also uh, civil strife and so on in some parts of the world, as we've seen, whether it's in Afghanistan, a number of African countries where <clears throat> there's some sort of, um, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, instability, political instability and so on. The international migration will also become a very, very key issue. I, 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 I liked the presentation, the, the, uh, the points that Sarah Harper made there regarding international migration, but this is also likely to increase due to increasing globalization, but there is also all sorts of uh, efforts to, 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 to reinforce regional integration and removing barriers to, uh, uh, for, for people to move around. The African Union is at the center of uh, trying to, to, to formulate this uh, uh, integrated African uh, economy, but also as inequalities grow, we, many people will be living, we're seeing what is happening in the US and, uh, and Latin America where people have no hope in their homes and they are all flocking to go to places where there are opportunities. And there's the issue now about the age distribution. So when you look at population change, there's the growth, there's the movement of people's partial distribution, then there's the dependency uh, uh, issues about the age structure of the population. And there we can look at what's going to happen in dependency ratios. So I'll just quickly jump at some of these points here. Uh, some of these points have already been made during the day, just to reinforce them. When we talk about population growth, there are really two regions that are, are continuing to, uh, to grow over, over, I mean, Africa will grow most likely for the rest of this century. And there isn't really much we can do to stop that. And uh, when you look at the projections, that pro the projections, might, they might be off by, you know, 
uh, a few millions here and there, but those projections are likely to come up. And uh, I think Sarah also talked about this issue about uh, the concept of population momenta. The people are already young, the age structure is already amenable, even if birth rates drop now uh, from four to two in many of these uh, African countries, those that are five, it will still take another 70, 80 years of the population continuing to grow because of the concept of population momentum. So Africa will continue to increase its share of the global population. South Asia will also grow in terms of numbers, but as a region, South uh, Asia will, will uh, the, 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 uh, the proportion of the global population will, will actually come down. And so the other regions will also be losing out in terms of a total um, a proportion of the total population. In Africa, looking at uh, uh, by 2050, really looking at a population of about 2.5 billion, um, uh, almost doubling from the number now. You can just look at the 10 top, uh, the biggest 10 most populous countries in Africa in 2020, these countries added up to 816 million people, which is um, uh, more than more than more than two thirds of the total population of um, of, uh, of Africa, in, the, in just in these ten countries. But when you look at uh, uh, 2050, the ten countries, there are some displacements there, where some of the countries that are in the top five, like Egypt, uh, not Egypt necessarily, but you see. Um, uh, South Africa uh, is going to be number 10 there right now, but you are seeing countries like Kenya, Uganda, really going up the radar there. But the point is, even in these countries that are the biggest, you are going to expect between 70 to 90 percent population growth um, over, over this period, and the total will be almost uh, uh, 1.5 billion just in those countries. The driving force is really the average number of children, which varies considerably by region. So you look at Southern Africa, which is uh, really gearing slowly towards that replacement level of 2.1, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, followed by Northern Africa. But you see Eastern, uh, uh, Western Africa and Central Africa are still the regions with the highest levels of fertility uh, at, at, at more than five beds per woman. Uh, uh, so this, these dimensions are going to be the main determinant because we know mortality rates are going down. It's going to be really what happens to fertility, what happens to uh, 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 how fast the fertility goes down. That's what will determine how far Africa will go in terms of population growth. And at what point, the, um, uh, when Africa will actually get to that um, uh, point of um, uh, a stable uh, growth or, 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 or no growth at all. So this, this issue about, about, about the spatial distribution, I think when we talk about population dynamics, we, really, we can't run away from the issue of urbanization. So when you see this chart here, the red bar is showing Africa. Right now, um, by 2020, Africa is the only region which still has less people living in urban areas than, than rural areas. But Africa is going to cross this very, very important milestone in uh, around 20, um, um, uh, the year 20, around 2030, 2035, thereabouts, just before 2035. And I think the point is we need to ask ourselves, especially for Africa, is, is Africa really going to take advantage of urbanization? Urbanization has been associated being the engine of socioeconomic transformation, of job creation. But what we've seen in many African countries is that um, our urban areas now are becoming a, a very, very central hub of poverty, the slums, the way they are growing in urban areas and so on. So it's an opportunity, it's going to continue happening. The big question is how does Africa, how, how does Africa turn this very, very important development phenomenon into a driving force for, uh, uh, for, 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 uh, for development and, uh, and uh, socioeconomic transformation? Um, the, the, the issue about uh, dependency ratios, really this kind of summarizes the story, the global story about this. In Africa, starting from, uh, this, this is the total dependency ratio where we are taking those zero to 19 and uh, 65 plus um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to those who are 20 to 64, potentially what you would call working age population. So Africa has the highest dependency ratio now, and that is mainly driven by child child dependency, the, 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 the big number of, um, uh, of young people who are, who are, who are really aged under, under 20. So this is going to continue declining as fertility declines and the rate at which fertility declines will affect the extent to which this change in the dependency ratio can help Africa actually uh, develop faster or you know, um, uh, accelerate its economic growth. 
Um, what you see now in Europe and the other regions, more pronounced in Europe, and that's the, the, the dependency ratio is also going to go up, mainly because of the aging factor there. But those are the main sort of um, trends you are looking at there. And the reason why we need to look at air population age structures is that, you know, the, the, the number, the proportion of people you have in a, in a given age group actually has very, very big ramifications on that country's capacity to take care of, uh, of its people. And I think you can argue as well that in terms of the balance between the well-being of people and, um, and the environment. So if you have more older people, you have to, of course, make sure that uh, you, uh, you, you have good social security systems and so on. If you have a lot of young people, um, the, 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 the child dependency, the problem, as many people have said, is that if you really can't address that, your chances of building quality human capital, of addressing a lot of the development challenges is going to be, is, is going to be curtailed. Um, this chart, I like this chart because, you know, uh, uh, the, the chart I showed you just a minute ago, uh, looking at the, um, uh, at the dependency ratios, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's not the real dependency ratio. It's just uh, the, uh, what, what we say based on the age, age groups. But this, using the uh, transfer, uh, uh, transfer, national transfer accounts data, you can actually look at the actual dependency in a population. So the yellow bar here is showing you, like for Nigeria, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the level of consumption in the country. So you can see that on the left-hand side, uh, these, uh, the young people, because they are not working, they are just consuming, but the, the blue part is showing what the labor income in the country is producing. So where you have the, um, uh, the, uh, the top part there in terms of uh, the, um, uh, uh, the part that is on top is the one that is showing you the surplus that the labor people who are in the working ages are producing that they are not consuming themselves. So when you talk about dependency, you are really looking at the, uh, the yellow part there, the clear yellow part, and the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the other yellow part at the end where you are looking at uh, old age um, uh, dependency and see whether that surplus, uh, the labor income surplus that you are producing is going to take care of the needs of, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the entire population. And I think as you can see here, the yellow parts, the clear yellow parts are much bigger than what the labor, uh, the labor, the labor income, uh, uh, the, the population is actually producing. This is the picture, the same picture for Senegal because birth rates are very, very high in Nigeria and so on. You see that the Nigeria situation is more stark. This is Senegal. Uh, the same picture for South Africa, and uh, this is a picture for Botswana, where at AFIDEP we just did, we did um, a demographic dividend analysis there in, in partnership with the government. And when we showed this data, it has really gotten the government of Botswana to think that they really have to do something. They have actually uh, just commissioned us to start another project to help them develop what they are saying is a demographic dividend uh, a delivery toolkit where we, we are supposed to help them in how they can do integrated planning to, to ensure that uh, whatever is left of the demographic dividend in Botswana can actually be maximized up to this point. Uh, just to illustrate that, the case for Botswana. So what you see for Botswana, if you have to break that down, it's a, what you call lifetime deficit here. So you are really looking at um, what the young people are consuming that they are not producing themselves. 23.8 billion Pula, uh, uh, the local currency in Botswana. And then at odd age, there's a deficit of 2.1 billion. But you see the surplus that the labor income is producing is only 2.5 billion. So when you combine the two, which is about 20, what, 25, 26 billion versus 2.5 billion, you have to ask the question, so how is the country surviving? It's definitely living beyond, beyond its means. And um, I mean, but, uh, Botswana has a lot of um, uh, uh, minerals, diamonds, and so on. But the point is, to what, um, um, as a country, to what extent are you going really to be to be dependent on those on those on those minerals, and for how long? And uh, with the uncertainty of the uh, extractive industry and so on, the country can get into problems with uh, this imbalance that you see here. Another thing, if you just compare, say, Botswana and South Africa, the red one is uh, Botswana. Uh, this chart can actually help you now understand at what age people are beginning to produce surplus income. So uh, that's, that's a good proxy for, uh, uh, for actually saying at what age are actually young people working. The UN data I showed earlier, we are assuming that uh, people at age 20, uh, 0 to 20 are dependents. But what you see here 
for uh, Botswana is that young people are actually are still being dependent until age 33. For South Africa, it's a, uh, the age is a little bit lower, it's about 29 then. But for Botswana, you see, they are entering the labor, the labor market um, a le uh, later, but they are also exiting area, a retiring area. So the, the period when the country, the labor force is producing income is, 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 is lower, is shorter than it is for South Africa. If you take the upper middle income country, which is the Bruin now, you see that both of these African countries, the young people are beginning to work or to produce a surplus later. And for Botswana still um, um, leaving the labor market um, um, uh, area. So our analysis showed that uh, if you look, Botswana is one of these countries where birth rates have already come down. It's a small country, yes, but this is illustrative of what is happening on the country. When we, we, we did the, um, uh, the, the, these, um, um, uh, these calculations, we realized that Botswana, the, the uh, improvement in well-being in Botswana can actually, 36% of total well-being uh, can, can actually be enhanced through how the country is going to take uh, care of the, uh, uh, to, take, to take advantage of the demographic dividend. And what it shows here is that by 2015, out of that 36% that the country can potentially harness, they had already harnessed 24%. And what is remaining, and this is because the birth rate in, uh, in Botswana is, is quite low, it's uh, what? It's about 2.3, 2 2.4, getting close to the, um, to the, to the uh, repressment level of fertility. So the, uh, the, the, the component of the first demographic dividend the country can harness, what is remaining of it is, is actually quite small, but the country can still do, uh, uh, you know, adopt some uh, policy actions that can help them maximize this even beyond the 12% that is remaining. Another critical point to note here, when we talk about the demographic dividend, we tend to talk about the demographic dividend in East Asia and so on. I think this chart and the evidence we are seeing in Africa, Northern African countries, Southern African countries, they have harnessed the demographic dividend already because of the decline in birth rates that have happened from five, six, about two decades ago to you know, somewhere between two, uh, 2.5 and three, which is where they are now. So the point is, any decline in birth infertility that you actually have, it, 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 it will invariably uh, allow you to harness some demographic dividend. The question that um, uh, actually we have to ask is, how much of the dividend can you actually maximize? If you make the other investments in education, in job creation and so on, that's what can allow you to maximize the demographic dividend. Just uh, some illustration for Botswana, we looked at uh, this issue to say, okay, what if, uh, what if, uh, if you look at this chart that was comparing Botswana and South Africa here and ask the question, if Botswana changed its economy to really create more, more jobs for its young people and move this, uh, this, uh, this curve for uh, 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 labor force participation for young people to the level where the middle, the, up, uh, the, uh, the upper middle income is, what would that do uh, to, to Botswana's um, uh, demographic dividend? And here we, we see that um, the cumulative boost in living standards between uh, by 2035 would be 21% with this shift as compared to about 12% with the status quo. Um, and um, you look at even fertility, Botswana's birth rate, I said, is already, is already relatively low. But if uh, the number of children uh, went, 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 went down as well from uh, uh, the status quo of, um, of, uh, of 2.9, to 2.1 by, uh, by 2040, uh, versus, uh, uh, versus if, you, if, you, if you came down to only 2.9, what, what, what would that impact be? You are moving from the status quo, having 5% um, uh, of the living standards being enhanced versus 18%. So these are, these are some of the data that we are looking at and engaging our policymakers across the African continent. And policymakers are listening to these data and asking the questions, what should we do exactly? This is just showing data from Senegal, emphasizing the, the, the gender demographic dividend. The blue curve actually showing male uh, labor income. The green one, the dotted one is showing the female labor income. And, and, and then the, the red one is consumption, where the consumption levels between men and women are not that different. But this just shows you the big, the big, the big problem that many African countries have. If you don't, increase the labor income, our, our, our female labor force participation rates closer to where the men is, it's going to be hard for the countries really to maximize the demographic dividend that they can harness. 
Um, I, I just want to look now at a couple of things relating to this relationship between population and climate change. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's very, very critical. There's been a lot of uh, discussion today about the uh, uh, climate change, uh, whether it's issues about mitigation, adaptation. But I think the main point here is that um, uh, we really need to look at the, the interaction between population and climate change as, a, as one holistic universe. Because as I said earlier on, we are really looking at the well-being of people and the well-being of the environment. And the climate change now is at the center of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of the whole you know, environment uh, equation. We know that um, um, Africa, of course, despite uh, 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 contributing least to, to global warming now, it's, it's really bearing the biggest brunt in terms of the consequences of climate change. We are seeing weather really changing uh, 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 very, very rapidly, persistent droughts, and um, uh, we have a drought this year. Next year, you have um, a very, very serious um, over flooding and, uh, and that sort of stuff. So natural disasters are becoming more common. The, uh, there's a big impact of uh, climate change on, uh, on health as well, uh, fear, with fears that uh, malaria and some uh, uh, tropical diseases like dengue are going to, to actually become more common and actually start now in areas that seem to be malaria-free at this time. We did some analysis just to look at the relationship between, um, uh, uh, between population, vulnerability to population pressure, as well as what is happening to, uh, to, to some aspects of the environment and climate change. So this chart here is showing you um, countries in Africa that are, that are considered to be water scarce countries, countries that are water stressed countries uh, in Euro. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, and so what you see is that there are like what, a handful of countries that really have serious water shortages on the continent. But when you also look at water scarcity, that is uh, becoming a big problem. But we also looked at the other side of it to look at the country's capacity to adapt to the consequences of, uh, of climate change. And what you see is um, uh, the, 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 the blue, the dark blue ones are the least resilient uh, populations, but these populations are also having high population growth rate. So what you are seeing now is that really there's this, um, uh, what you might call a, 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 a double tragedy in a way that the countries that are, least, that are least resilient, the countries that are least capable of coping to the consequences of climate change, they are also facing the most rapid population growth. And the combination of these two factors are actually undermining this country's capacity to develop um, uh, altogether. When you combine the uh, the uh, the issue about 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 climate change and um, and um, uh, 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 the capacity to adapt to climate change, population growth, and so on, we came up with these countries that we called the climate change and population hotspots. The countries that that are really facing this uh, dual burden. So, when you look at this, I think it's very very clear here that you can't really think about improving the well-being of people in these countries in a sustainable manner if you do not tackle simultaneously issues related to population growth, as well as um, um, uh, issues related to the environment and, uh, and improving their capacity to adapt. So what we are really talking about here is that there is need to have that holistic approach, the, what we call the population environment and development nexus. But for you to do that, we need to use, to use system thinking because uh, you need to look at the, um, at the, at the, at the whole horizon as, 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 as one system where there are people who are, you know, are playing their role, they are their actors as agents of, uh, you know, uh, driving what is happening on population, but also as, as, uh, as, uh, as, as, as agents who can help to build this resilience to, uh, to, uh, to population change. So um, as, as, as I end now, I just want to say, you know, when, when you look at the issue of um, how does Africa turn its, 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 its youthful population, which we now see is going to grow very, very rapidly, uh, how, what, what needs to be done to turn this into a demographic dividend, to maximize the demographic dividend? So you see that on the right-hand side here, there are issues I've talked about, female labor force participation. There are some norms about fertility and preferences and so on. I think it's very, very clear when you look at other regions of the world that uh, one of the major challenges with rap uh, achieving rapid fertility decline in Africa is that uh, Africa's decline started at a time when uh, fertility preferences and norms still, you know, um, are facilitated or preferred um, a bigger families. So female empowerment, education being very critical. I think there's been talk about child mortality there. 
But that's where now, once you, you, you work on, uh, on that area, you then come to the middle part where you have to talk about making sure that there's universal access to voluntary family planning. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, as marriage, uh, as marriage uh, patterns change, partly also due to promoting uh, female education, that's what will actually create this enabling environment for the transition from, um, um, uh, from high to rapidly declining fertility. And what this will do is that it will create a temporary youth badge. Um, a lot of people tend to say, even in Africa, a lot of politicians say, oh, we have a youth badge in Africa, we have a youth badge. But the fact is when you look at the data, what Africa really has is not the youth badge, it's actually the child badge, those people below age 15. In many countries between 44, some even close to 50%. What Africa needs is first, we need to create the youth badge and death rates need to come down to around three and then once they come down even more, that's when now you create the labor force badge. And it's where, and, and now you have to move, after you have created the youth badge, you have to look at what do we need to do to maximize the demographic dividend. So countries like Botswana have created the youth badge and the youth badge on its own gives you that natural dividend. But to maximize it, you have to make sure that there's quality human capital, you have investments in education, not only increasing enrollment, not only saying we keep girls in school, but to reforming education, to produce quality 21st century labor force that will drive the socioeconomic transformation and development that Africa needs to see. So you have to do that. You have to have that economic empowerment and entrepreneurship, job creation at a mass level. Um, then you, you look at governance and accountability, the corruption levels that you see in Africa. Where is the money to, to develop the human capital and create, the, create the, uh, the jobs going to come from if we continue seeing this, uh, this rot, not only in, in, in the stealing itself, but also in making sure that uh, there's, uh, there's optimal use of the resources that are there. So it's accountability, not only in use of uh, public resources, but but accountability and service delivery as well, so that for the money that is there, you're getting the best value. And I think the main point we are emphasizing, a lot of people talked about the demographic dividend, the discussion, the narrative from East Asia never really looked at the issue of environmental preservation. But we are saying that in Africa, you can't really talk about sustainable demographic dividend if you don't look at the environment and what is happening uh, across the continent. So we're talking about systems thinking. I listened earlier on to some of the debates that were going on about, oh, let's, we, we, the number needs to be, the birth rate needs to be 1.5, the birth rate needs to be two, or needs to be what for, for, for us to get sustainable population growth. I think for me, it's sometimes this discussion that gets a lot of uh, policymakers, especially in the global south, to think that the issue about, about family planning is about limiting the numbers in the global south. So we need to get away from this sort of talk. I think from 1994, the international community agreed it's about enabling couples to get the number of children they want and when they want to get that children. And I think the truth is that this can be achieved across Africa because we have very, very high levels of unmet need. And if you just increase contraceptive use by what, 10, 15 percentage points, a birth rate will come down. And just by addressing the bottlenecks women are already facing, um, to, to uh, bottlenecks to access and demand for family planning and so on, contraceptive use will go up, birth rates will come down naturally. We don't need to talk about, oh, let's reduce the numbers and so on. So it's systems thinking, looking at people, education, food security, resilience. We have to look at the economy. There's the big question, where would the mass jobs in Africa come from? You can't really harness a sizable demographic dividend if the economies can't create enough jobs. In Asia, industrialization came in. I think there was the cause relationship between uh, East Asia and, uh, and the West, which has continued. But Africa has huge bottlenecks to uh, uh, the, the terms of trade and that the way Africa is treated on the on the global market, in the, in the globalization um, uh, process and so on, it's very, very different. And I think you have to ask, where will these jobs come from? It doesn't look like industrialization will be the path. Uh, it will most likely, is it IT, innovation and so on? But you can't also have mass innovation if the education systems are not producing uh, a quality uh, 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 graduates who can actually lead this innovation. So 
the environment, I've already talked about it, I've talked about governance, but I think the point about family planning, let's continue to talk about voluntary family planning. Africa has changed a lot. In 2017, the African Union, one of what you might call the most conservative bodies on the continent, decided to make its top development agenda harnessing the demographic dividend through investments in youth. And people know for you to do that, you're talking about birth rates. And, uh, and I think pol politicians are listening. The big questions they are asking now is, how should we get this done? How can we do integrated planning? So when we're talking about um, um, uh, uh, technical assistance that needs to be provided to Africa, we need to understand these issues and understand that it's the voluntary family planning that will make the way. I think the issue about talking about numbers, or oh, we should aim for this number, will get us nowhere. It got us nowhere from the 70s to now. It's the positive message that like the demographic dividend framework is bringing to the table to say, actually, you can benefit from investing in the population that you have to, to grow faster and to become a more formidable continent because it's when the population, you turn this big growing African population into quality human capital with high purchasing power. That's the only way Africa will compete on the, on the global market. There's the cost to inaction. If we don't act, if we don't take these actions, make voluntary family planning, invest in education and, and accelerate, um, uh, help accelerate people's uh, reproductive, uh, 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 the fulfillment of their aspirations, then the opposite side is that we are going to have more problems globally. We've already seen what's happening, as I said, in the US, a lot of young people without hope of anything in their countries, they're just taking risks. We've already seen, you know, even coming to Europe, a lot of young people taking risks, all these boats and the bodies that we've seen on the, um, uh, on, the, on the ocean, there are people risking their lives. This will become bigger and bigger. So uh, the, the issue is that we need, the global community needs to look at Africa and, uh, and look at it um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a global partner, not just as a problem. And, uh, but knowing that if we don't help Africa address these issues within the African continent, these will become um, a very, very serious global issues. I'll end by just noting that um, uh, one of my, uh, my, my, my most proud moments uh, in my career was that in 2012, I was part of the panel that uh, did the Royal Society book that was called People and Planet. Um, and at this, we reviewed all the evidence and we're tackling the same issues we are, we are trying to talk about today. How do we address population challenges that the global community is facing? And uh, at the same time, when you throw in the environment, there's the big issue about um, uh, what should we do uh, to, 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 to address global warming? And the, the, there were about, what, eight, is it 10 uh, recommendations from the book? But I think the two most critical ones talked about the importance of the international community coming together to bring then there were 1.3 billion people living on less than $1.25 $1 to bring them out of absolute poverty. Now that number I just checked yesterday, it's 1.9 billion. It was 1.3 billion. So it's, uh, it's growing, but I think that's the issue. And when you look at these, the 1.9 billion people that we are looking at, they are the people who have the highest uh, levels of unmet need for family planning. They don't have the, the right education. They don't have the skills. That's the people that we need to focus on. And I think if you look at Africa, South Asia, what we are saying is if you make those investments, it will actually help propel the socioeconomic transformation in these countries. Of course, the caveat to this, I should say caveat in courts, is that once we improve the well-being of these two billion people, the, 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 their consumption will go up and it will make some small it will make some contribution to global warming as well. But I don't think that the issue is, uh, is really looking at whether we should do that because of global warming or the environment. It's a human right issue to make sure that these people are brought out of poverty. The bigger issue, and it's the second bullet there, if we have to address global warming, it's when we go to the, you know, to the Paris um, uh, 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 issues, discussions about, about climate change and so on. It's the, it's, the, uh, it's the developed countries that have to take the lead in that. It's the developed countries that have to change their, their, uh, the behaviors, the consumption behavior. So this was the recommendation from people on planet. The most developed and the emerging economies must stabilize and then reduce material consumption levels. Of course, the African countries don't just have to take the path or the, the, the least developed countries 
and say we we'll improve our consumption and uh, do that um, aimlessly. I think they, they are now the technology has improved. They are they are they are you know uh, uh, development can be done in a greener manner in a way that we preserve the environment. But at the end of the day, we have that obligation and putting family planning at the center of our discussion about uh, uh, about about sustainable development is very very key. It has to be at the center of that of that of that whole discussion because. If you don't make that family planning available there, there's going to be a lot of challenges and, uh, and a lot of the efforts to, to, uh, to, to improve the well-being of people, to fulfill the SDG um, goal of leaving no one behind will actually not happen. So thank you very much. This is what I wanted to say. I mean, as I listen to the talk today, I've talked mainly about the situation in Africa. That's where I mainly work. But I think these issues relate to uh, to the uh, to, to 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 other you know least developed countries even outside Africa and South Asia and so on, but it's not even just about Africa. It's about the global community because what ends up happening in Africa will actually uh, affect everybody around the globe in due in due course. Thanks very much, and um, yeah, I end there. <laughs>